All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Noon Case Conference. Um, today, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Angelos. Peter Angelos, MD, PhD, is the Linda Kohler Anderson Professor of Surgery, the Chief of Endocrine Surgery, and the Director of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics here at the University of Chicago. He earned his MD and a PhD in philosophy at Boston University, completed his general surgery residency at Northwestern University, and his endocrine surgery fellowship under the direction of Norm Thompson at the University of Michigan. As one of the pioneers in the discipline of surgical ethics, he writes, speaks, and teaches widely on ethical issues in surgical practice and how to best teach medical ethics to surgical residents. As an accomplished surgeon and past president of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons, Dr. Angelos has published more than 250 peer-reviewed papers and dozens of book chapters on his research into improving outcomes of thyroid and parathyroid surgery, minimally invasive endocrine surgery, and best practices for thyroid cancer treatment. He has trained 12 endocrine surgery fellows, hundreds of surgical residents, and has been an inspiration to the over 80 surgeons who have completed the McLean Center Fellowship in Clinical Medical Ethics. A very skilled and patient surgeon, thoughtful mentor, and all around exceptional human being and friend, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Angelos, whose talk today is entitled, The Value of Clinical Ethics in Contemporary Medical Care. Uh, thank you, Dr. Applewhite, for introducing me very nicely. I appreciate it. Thank you all uh, for being here. Um, I was, uh, uh, I'm happy to get a chance to give this talk today. I know that um, uh, this has been uh, a large series of talks, and so in some ways, um, this could have gone at the beginning, could have gone at the end, uh, but it's in the middle. And so uh, that's because uh, there was a speaker in May who couldn't come in May, but I thought it would be good for you all to hear him. So he's given the last one, and that's why mine is in the middle. Um, I, uh, uh, with that said, um, I uh, will go right ahead, assuming that I can. And now suddenly I cannot. Oh, interesting. Okay. So I have no disclosures. Uh, and so by way of outline, um, I'm going to talk about really um, three things. Uh, what's distinctive about clinical ethics? Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the mission of the McLean Center. This is a work in progress, um, but I think it's valuable for you all to see um, how uh, we're thinking about it. And then I'll talk a little bit about moral distress and clinical ethics and how I think those things are related in uh, just a couple uh, minutes about future directions. So by way of contrast, um, I want to think a little bit about the difference between bioethics in a sort of general sense and clinical ethics. And, um, and to quote the uh, Britannica Online, uh, a reputable source, according to some, uh, bioethics is a branch of applied ethics that studies the philosophical, social, and legal issues arising in medicine and the life sciences, chiefly concerned with human life and well-being. Though it, is sometime, though it sometimes also treats ethical questions related to the non-human biological environment. So obviously a big topic um, and an important topic. What about clinical ethics? And so, so and here I'm um, quoting from Edmund G. Howe, who has been the editor in chief of the Journal of Clinical Ethics since 1990. This is 1990, volume one, issue number one. Uh, Dr. Howe wrote, the focus is not on armchair ethics, i.e. the theoretical exploration of ethical views, but on the application of ethical inquiry to solve problems at the bedside to help clinicians and patients. And it's really this focus on at the bedside um, helping clinicians and patients, I think that was sort of the driving force of the founding of the McLean Center. And, um, and 
the founding of the McLean Center um, is completely uh, due to the efforts of Dr. Mark Siegler. And Dr. Siegler, I appreciate you being here today. It's really an honor that you're here. Um, so uh, Dr. Siegler was uh, on the editorial board of the Journal of Clinical Ethics from day one. Um, he had a series of articles in the very first issues of this journal that helped define clinical ethics. Um, and um, and so, so it is important to think about this distinction of clinical ethics being a very applied discipline as opposed to a more theoretical uh, bioethics. Now, um, I would say that the purview of clinical ethics has widened over recent decades. Um, and certainly, uh, I think we know that the focus is not purely on the patient-caregiver interactions. Um, that's been the case, I think, for a while now. And clinical ethics today does need to attend to how the decisions we make on multiple levels of healthcare impact the outcomes of patients. And so I do think that we can talk about big system issues and it's still clinical ethics if our focus on the big system issues is really, well, what's the impact on patients of those decisions? Um, and the goal of clinical ethics ought to be the improvement of the care of patients, regardless of where among the many levels of a system the changes are being made. At least that's what I've suggested. So uh, I do think that there's something that's distinctive about the focus of clinical ethics. Um, and the argument that I want to make now very briefly, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but I think it's not just that the scope has changed, um, but that there's a little bit of a different um, series of things that we think are important when we do clinical medical ethics as opposed to sort of theoretical bioethics. And I'll try to explain that a little bit. Um, so, so the attention to how we answer what should be done is different in these different realms, although they overlap. Um, and so let me use a case um, to help illustrate that difference, because I'm hopeful that the case will make this more clear than I've been able to so far. So this is a case from the University of New Mexico Trauma Service. I was there um, as a visiting professor a couple months ago. Um, and um, the trauma team told me about a patient. I won't go into all the surgical details because they're not relevant, but the, the important things, 22-year-old man was involved in a high-speed motor vehicle collision. He suffered multiple fractures and had severe traumatic brain injury. Um, the patient, so social factors that are important. The patient is not married. Uh, the parents were the surrogate decision makers. There was no controversy about that. Um, and he had no advanced directives. So the things that we might ask about in clinical uh, case conference, um, I think those are important things. So uh, a few more details. Um, he was found to have really no significant neurologic function. Over the next few days, testing confirmed death by neurologic criteria. And again, you know, you, you have heard many discussions about what that criteria is and whether there's controversies about that. For the sake of discussion of this case, there was no controversy. This patient met the criteria for brain death. Important, parents don't speak English. Through an interpreter, um, they're found to have very poor health literacy. So the parents' response to the news that the, that the patient, that their son had died um, was, and you know, this is not a, it's in quotation marks, but it's via translator. So it's not exactly a direct quote, but it was essentially, he looks just like he did when he left the house that morning before he got in the accident, don't stop the ventilator or you will be killing him and we won't allow you to do that. 
and um, the 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 there was a discussion about organ donation and you know that all of the things that generally happen when a patient um, uh, is declared uh, dead by um, brain death criteria. Um, they said they had no interest in that because he wasn't dead. And the father said, "It's I'm going to become violent if you turn if you think you're going to turn off the ventilator. It's not going to happen." and I'll make sure it doesn't happen. And so really did threaten violence and, uh, and people were concerned that he was really very serious about it. So the question, and, and um, uh, you know, when you're a visiting professor, one of the fun things is that people get to ask you, you know, the tough cases. And, uh, uh, and you know, if, if I'm a visiting professor for endocrine surgery, they ask me about, well, what would you do for this thyroid cancer? Um, if I'm invited more for ethics, then it's a case like this. So, you know, what should be done? Um, and, uh, and, and I do think that, um, you know, I said, well, what do you all see as the problem? And so they said, well, there's a brain dead patient taking up an ICU bed in a busy urban medical center. We feel as though this is inappropriate use of resources. We're squandering resources. Um, and, um, and this idea that the parents are refusing to accept brain death as death, um, certainly problematic. And um, as is my uh, general practice when I'm asked tough questions is to ask a lot more other questions to the people there. Um, and so ultimately um, they uh, told me what they did, um, but let's pause before we get to that. Let's think a little bit about what would theoretical bioethics answer what should be done here? Um, and. This is perhaps a, you know, an unfair straw man argument, but I'm gonna make it nevertheless. Um, I would say that bioethics would say, hospitals treat patients. When you're brain dead, there's a body, but no longer a patient. And there's no dilemma. You turn off the ventilator and you make the bed available for a patient who needs it. And it's sort of like, what's the problem? Because from a theoretical point of view, we don't really have any um, responsibility to bodies other than to treat them with respect, um, but certainly not to keep them in ICUs taking up bed space from someone else. Uh, now, in contrast, the clinical ethics perspective, which interestingly enough was what the trauma team did. And this was, you know, if this case had happened long before I was ever there, so I had nothing to do with it. But there, what they did seemed to me very much fits with the way we think about clinical ethics. Um, and their thinking was, although there's a need for beds, immediately turning off the ventilator would be traumatic for everyone. So traumatic for the parents, traumatic for the doctors, the nurses, everybody involved in the care of this patient. And they felt that they had some responsibility to the parents, interestingly enough, um, and that they should think a little bit about the parents' well being and not solely about this issue of what do we do with bodies in hospitals when we need beds. Um, and their sensitivity to the parents and other caregivers, um, they felt that that warranted a delay in the removal of the ventilator. And you know, you could argue with what they did, um, but what they did was they said, in three days, we're gonna have to turn off the ventilator. Now, why three days rather than two or four? I don't know. I didn't make the decision. I wasn't caring for the patient. 
Um, but their idea was we have to give this, this family a little bit of time to grieve, to sort of come to grips with what was happening. Um, and during that time, they had multiple family meetings. Um, they tried to explain what brain death meant, that he, despite how he looked, was never going to be waking up, was never going to be going back to the way he was. Um, and they looked at this as an opportunity. They, the, the trauma team said to me, well, we can't help the patient, but we can help the parents. And in their assessment, that was a reasonable um, way to justify the use of resources. Now, it's pretty expensive, no question about that. We could have conversations about that. Um, but other family members were involved in the discussions and ultimately helped the parents to accept the death of their son. And so they turned off the ventilator. There was no violence. The father was not happy, but how could you be happy in this circumstance? Um, so, so what I think is important in this case is not so much about, you know, could they have done things differently? Could they have tweaked things? But was the outcome a success? Now, from a bed utilization perspective, one would argue no, right? You kept an ICU bed occupied and unavailable to someone who could benefit from it for a period of time. But there was no violence, that seems good. Um, and although the, as I said, although the father remained upset, other family members helped him accept the inevitability of the discontinuation of the ventilator. And I do think that in this sort of family's narrative of what happened to their son, um, waiting three days had value. And I would argue that it had value because it allowed them to come to grips with this in some fashion um, and allowed them to then um, sort of tell the story of what happened to their son in a very different way than would have been the case otherwise. Um, and, and I would argue that this, uh, that this case hopefully illustrates to some extent that the scope of concern in clinical ethics appropriately um, is cognizant of some things that might have been missed if we were taking a much more theoretical uh, approach to the problem. And I do think that um, as we see on a weekly basis, decision-making in clinical ethics necessitates attention to not only the patient, um, but to those who care for the patient. And those who care for the patient are sometimes the family, the surrogates, and also the professional caregivers in the hospital. And so those who care for the patient, I think ex means both of these sets of people. Um, and, and, and if you look at this, I would say for those of you who may be familiar, this seems to sound a lot like what has been described as a care ethic. Um, and so for those who may not be as familiar with it, I'll just say a couple words. The ethics of care developed largely in response to principalism and um, Carol Gilligan, uh, 1982 book is sort of largely credited with sort of starting this um, uh, idea. And uh, the ethics of care rejects a hierarchical view of ethics in favor of a more relational one. Um, and it, it sort of, uh, I guess, anthropologically grew out of what she, what Carol Gilligan described as a feminine view of how decisions are made, which are as much less hierarchical. Um, and the argument goes something like persons interact in networks of relationships rather than in isolation and the relationships and human connections matter. And so when you're thinking about what's the right thing to do, 
those relationships then become very important. Um, and rather than taking a deductive approach from ethical principles, a care ethic looks to the specific situation. Again, sounds a lot like clinical medical ethics. Um, and solutions to conflict are sought in the context of the parties involved. Um, and the goodness of a decision is determined by the manner in which it enhances the relationships. So we say, well, that was a good decision if there's been some sense in which we have uh, strengthened the bonds, the relationships of the parties involved. Um, so obviously one could spend a lot more time delving into uh, an ethics of care, but I do think that uh, this idea of what things we think about when we make decisions, you know, why is it that in Dr. Siegler's book, um, uh, Clinical Ethics, that the four boxes, the four box model, why does that include the family and surrogate decision makers? Well, because they are important in the decision making. And so that, that those relationships then I think are uh, matter and good solutions according to a care ethic uh, resolve conflicts and improve relationships. So let me turn now to the second of my sort of three major uh, things to talk about um, today. And that is the evolving mission of the McLean Center. Um, and so, um, Certainly, the mission of the center has grown in recent years, um, and uh, in the last several months, um, there's been a deliberate effort to revise and uh, update our mission. Um, and I do want to really give special thanks to associate and assistant directors um, uh, who are all listed here, Marshall Chin, Megan Applewhite, Micah. Uh, Prohaska, Monica Peak, Lori Zoloff, Dan Brudney, Julie Kaur, Valerie Koch, and Will Parker, all of whom have been involved in some of these discussions. Um, and so uh, I, I do want to just share with you a draft version. We're still working on this. This is a work in progress. Um, and um, certainly we'll have more formal opportunities to uh, discuss it, but I thought it would be a good time to have a preliminary um, conversation. So uh, the mission then of the center as we're thinking about it going forward is to innovate and excel in clinically driven ethics inquiry, education and service that improves care, transforms systems, advances equity and informs policy to improve health for patients and communities. So again, it's not different, but uh, perhaps a, a broader view. Um, and the vision statement uh, is uh, for fair, just, and equitable care of individuals and communities that maximizes their health and well being. Now, there are then a number of ethical commitments then that. Uh, we would be making if we're going to actually have this mission and the and this set of values. And that is to engage in collaborative transdisciplinary inquiry and education that integrates ethics and clinical, biological, social, and humanistic sciences to improve the care of individuals and communities, to explore, ethical issues in healthcare through rigorous research methods guided by conceptual models and rooted in clinical relevance, to address and engage the ethical issues that impact health outcomes at multiple levels, including patient, family, clinician, organization, community, and policy, to build mutually respectful relationships with partners, including patients, families, and communities, to challenge norms as agile, innovative thought leaders, to train and mentor the next generation of leaders in healthcare ethics, inquiry, and service, and to be a beacon for humanism and social justice in healthcare. Now, certainly very aspirational, 
Um, but there's no sense, um, you know, writing it down if it doesn't give you something to shoot for, in my opinion. Um, now, let me turn then uh, to talk a little bit about this third issue. And this is a little bit of a it's sort of a, a different idea, which is how uh, burnout and moral distress might be impacted by uh, clinical ethics or our attention to clinical ethics. So we know burnout's an important issue in medicine, and uh, I'm not sure whether there's an epidemic of uh, burnout or just greater awareness, but either way, it's a problem. We should attend to it. Um, and I do think that you know we have to realize that burnout is a risk factor for depression and suicide, which are clearly huge issues, not only for um, the medical profession and everyone involved in hospital care, uh, but for society. And you know, uh, at least among physicians, about 400 physicians a year commit suicide. So it's this is not trivial. Now, um, there are a number of factors that have been associated with um, caregiver burnout. Um, these have been described by others. And so again, I won't spend a lot of time on it. Loss of autonomy, a diminished sense of value in clinical activities. Some people say the electronic medical record, that's the root cause of it all. I'm not sure that's true. Uh, it doesn't help, but it's not the problem uh, in its entirety. Um, some people have said that inclusive language may actually devalue individual contributions. Um, and so if we talk about providers, that suggests a cog in the wheel rather than someone essential, like my nurse or my doctor. And so maybe that has a role, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, we know that there are certainly personal characteristics um, that might reduce the risk of burnout. And again, lots of attention has been given to this. Um, resilience uh, is something that, you know, we're told we should be more resilient. We should be able to bounce back from adversity and that will make us less susceptible to burnout. Um, the capacity, uh, the ability to bear the many unavoidable irritants of daily life with relative equanimity so having greater capacity in this context would seem to protect us in some sense uh, from the risks of burnout. Um, and um, starting, I think, around 2018, we started having Resilience Week for GME, for the Medical Center. Um, I was particularly impressed in uh, the 2019 uh, Resilience Week um, happened to fall during the polar vortex. I don't know if you all remember that, but I was uh, really, I thought it was very ironic that it was canceled due to extreme cold. You know, it seems like that you should be resilient enough, but anyway, that's a totally different thing. Um, but it was all canceled because it was very cold out. Uh, so, you know, could there be aspects of providing medical care that increase our resistance to burnout? Well, I think so. And I actually think that by emphasizing the ethical dimension of the care of patients, that may help us as caregivers, as well as helping our patients. And so um, just to give you a sense of why I think this is the case, um, moral injury and caregiver distress, again, are things that have been widely described uh, in recent years. Moral injury is described as occurring when we perpetrate, bear witness to, or fail to prevent an act that transgresses our deeply held moral beliefs. Um, and whether it's moral injury or moral distress, putting the needs of patients first I would say is central to the deeply held moral beliefs of most physicians, nurses, and other caregivers. And every time we're forced to make a decision that contravenes our patient's best interests, we often feel a sting of moral injustice. And over time, these repetitive insults amass to what people have described as moral injury. So again, you could argue with the definitions um, but certainly there is something here to be concerned about. 
Um, and more, burnout and moral injury may be complementary views of the central problem of uh, clinical distress or clinician distress. Um, interesting that burnout suggests that it's my problem. I suffer from burnout, um, that I lack resilience, whereas moral injury describes the challenge of simultaneously knowing what care patients needs, but being unable to provide it due to constraints. So it sort of pushes the problem away from me and my own personal characteristics. Now, you know, there, there are some pros and cons of this move, um, but I think it's important to think about how that happens. Um, yeah. And some people believe, and I think there's some very, uh, there's a lot of truth in it that long-term solutions to moral injury demand changes in the business framework of healthcare. And that there may be limits to what we as individuals can do to mitigate these things in, in the context of the system in which we work. Now, uh, the question that I'm interested in is how might attention to the ethical dimension of patient care mitigate these issues of burnout and moral distress. Um, and I do think that regardless of the practice setting one is in, the individual relationship of a caregiver and a patient is an intensely personal one. And um, you know, we do ask our patients to trust us individually as well as to trust the institution. Um, and I do think that responsibility to uphold our patient's trust is a central motivator to medical excellence, regardless of sort of the context in which we practice, regardless of our specialty, regardless of exactly how we care for patients. Um, and I mean, I think it, to me, if you reflect on why do many people choose to go into medicine, well, the opportunity to help people, right? That's the classic, you know, interview question for medical school. Why do you want to be a doctor? Because I like helping people, right? I guess maybe you don't get asked that question anymore. I was definitely asked that question and I answered the same way. Um, you know, if there's any joy in medicine or surgery, I would say, and I think there is personally, but you know, everyone has to make their own decision. Um, it's about helping patients. And so if there's no sense in which I gain some joy out of helping patients, then I think that's problematic. Um, and regardless of how devalued any of us may feel in our jobs, for each individual patient, and again, for me, I'm asking them to lie down in the OR and let me cut their throats, um, but you know, in any, anything that we do in medicine, we're asking people to trust us quite a bit with either personal information or intimate details about their physical, emotional, psychological lives. Um, and so all of these things, I think if we realize the impact that we have on patients, um, that I think that may help uh, protect us against the risk of burnout. Now, how do we then emphasize this, this ethical dimension in healthcare? Well, I think that we need to take seriously how well or how poorly we communicate with patients. I think that it's not, uh, so in, you know, in surgery, we talk a lot about informed consent, right? We talk about risk benefits and alternatives, but we know that communication is much more than here is a list of the risk benefits and alternatives. That's not communication. Um, and, and I think that we need to emphasize the development of communication skills in uh, our optimal education and practice. Um, and I would say we need to acknowledge the central role of trust in the relationships between caregivers and patients. And I think that we, we frequently don't do that enough. And um, it, was, it was striking to me um, when I was recently reviewing our University of Chicago's informed consent form, the actual form that patients sign before they go into the operating room. Um, and unless I read it wrong, which is possible, I didn't see trust anywhere in there. Uh, 
it's much more of a contractual relationship, which I think goes very much against what we're in fact trying to present to our patients. Um, now, there are many things that we can control and things that we can't control. And lack of control, without a doubt, is a major source of frustration felt by many physicians, nurses, everyone who works in large institutional practices today, and probably in every other industry as well, although I can't speak to those others because I've never been paid to do anything else. Well, I was paid to scoop ice cream one summer. Um, and I used to do professional magic and I got paid to do that, but that was a long time ago. Um, but so, so there is, there's a, a, a when there's a loss of control, that I think increases our risks of burnout. And um, the interesting thing is that, you know, in the privacy of the exam room, when I'm there with a patient, um, I have control over that interaction. I'm the one who can decide, well, how much of an effort do I put into engendering that trust? How much of an effort do I uh, put into ensuring that my communication is actually effective? rather than just I've turned the switch and now I'm doing my thyroidectomy spiel in which I talk about risk benefits and alternatives. Uh, and I do think that despite the time pressures that we have in the care of patients today, um, there's no administrator that can affect how well or how poorly I engender my patient's trust. That's ultimately up to me. And it depends on how seriously I take that as a responsibility. Um, now, we know, and I'm going to just talk just for a minute about surgeons because that's what I know about. You can think about in other areas in healthcare how much this applies. Um, but multiple studies have pointed out that serious, the serious detrimental impact of complications on surgeon well being. So we know if we have a complication that's bad for patients. But it also has a negative impact on the well being of surgeons. And some people have described the surgeon as the second victim of a complication. Now, if you're the patient who had the complication, I'm pretty sure you would say, I don't really care that much about the second victim. I'm worried about the first victim. And I understand that. Um, but from a caregiver perspective, this is a potential issue to think about. And lots of institutions have sought to reduce this impact. And there are some departments of surgery, for example, that have peer counselors. And so if you have a complication, then you, know, you can call the peer counseling uh, hotline. Um, I was uh, visiting an institution a couple of years ago um, where they have a program where um, uh, if anything bad happens, um, caregivers, no matter what their specialty, what their field is, they can call, it's referred to as the SWADL program. Um, and so, uh, and, I, and I asked the Department of Surgery that had invited me, I said, so, you know, do you get a lot of surgeons calling the SWADL program? And they said, zero, because no surgeon says, I need swaddling. <laughs> so now, you know, that's a problem. Um, there are you know, worthwhile interventions, these and probably many others may be even more effective. Um, but I would also suggest that focusing on the ethical dimension of surgical care might also help. And I do think that by ensuring that the adequacy of informed consent um, uh, is a way to engage our patients in the decision-making process. And certainly shared decision-making acknowledges that the surgeon does not always know best, that does not always know best, um, and that complications can and do occur. And, and I do think that, you know, having had a conversation with a patient to say, you know, this could happen to you, it doesn't diminish the physical impact of a complication on a patient but I do think that it has a significant impact on the psychological implications, both for the patient and for the physician. Because if I say, do you remember when I had that conversation about how I might injure your recurrent laryngeal nerve? 
such that your voice is permanently hoarse. Again, that doesn't make it better, but at least I think it reduces some of the stress associated with that conversation. So, um, you know, uh, hopefully I have at least given you a little bit of a thumbnail sketch about why uh, there's value in acting ethically. Um, I do think that patients benefit from ethical surgeons. Um, I do think that caregivers can also benefit from a greater attention to the ethical dimension. And again, I say surgical care, but it's everything we do in hospitals. So it's not limited to surgery. I do think that the attention to the ethical dimension requires caregivers to attend to expertise outside of medical science. So if we think that communication is an essential component of being a good caregiver in the medical field, then we should realize that we may not be the experts at communication and other things. Um, so, you know, I do think that increasingly everybody involved in healthcare is faced with a dilemma. Um, and that is that we are increasingly pushed to measure outcomes and quantify results. Um, and, you know, the movement towards quality in throughout medicine is all about sort of measurement. Um, and that's a good thing. Lord Kelvin said nicely, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Kelvin, right? The guy who, uh, what's the, the thermometer, I think? Kelvin scale, you know, I remember that vaguely. Um, unfortunately, it's really difficult to quantify ethical behavior. We can't measure it in the same way, but we still have to encourage it. And Einstein said it nicely, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. Um, so, uh, I'm going to end with just a few thoughts about sort of future directions. Um, and I do think that we have to acknowledge the distinctive features of clinical ethics um, and embrace this broader role that I think we can have. Um, I think that we have to embrace the value that clinical ethics can bring to patients, families, and surrogates, as well as to caregivers. Uh, I think that we have to endeavor to live up to our mission um, and that we have to work to make the vision of fair, just, and equitable care a reality for all of our patients. And we have to aim to improve the health of patients and uh, of communities. Um, so a few final thoughts. I've only got 30 more slides, so we're good. It's a joke. Um, I think it's good to be ethical. Um, I hope that um, that is not a controversial statement. Uh, I think that it's good to be ethical because it's just good, right? There's an intrinsic value, but there's also, I think, a value for patients and caregivers. Um, and I do think that the scope of concern for clinical ethics appropriately considers the impact of patient decisions on the families and surrogates. Um, and I do think that the mission of the McLean Center focuses on not only patients and caregivers, but also on the community. Um, so uh, last two thoughts, I think clinical ethics will remain the core of the center's mission, but contemporary clinical ethics must have a broader focus than it did 40 years ago. Um, and I do think that this greater attention to the ethical dimension of care may prove benefit not only to patients, but also to caregivers. Um, so with that, I'm gonna end and I'm very happy to uh, answer questions. Thank you. Brian. So I, I noticed on one of the slides you were talking about the, the mission of the McLean Center. And one of the lines is it, it sort of switches from the clinical ethics to healthcare ethics. I'm really interested in sort of that, that sort of switch because uh -huh. I couldn't imagine healthcare ethics being much broader than what we're talking about in clinical ethics. And, and does it bring into play sort of systems, you know, the ethics of the systems that we go in, you know? Sure. Does it then bring into sort of play um, more directly to 
resource allocation questions that you brought up, or even sort of business aspects. Like yeah. Is it appropriate? Where is it appropriate for us as a healthcare system right. to expand? Yeah. In, in terms of sort of making decisions and what to talk about for our community. So I'm just interested in what, how deliberate that was. Yeah. And what that means to you. Sure. When you use the term healthcare ethics. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for asking that question. Um, you know, I think that uh, I I believe that it is uh, that clinical ethics actually covers all of that, and um, and so so in some ways, um, I think that there there's been I think. It, and and part of what I what I've tried to suggest is that um, clinical ethics should be thought of in a much broader scope than we have in the past. And so it is true that um, the health system uh, and the policies that impact that health system have huge implications on what happens with individual patients. And so in that context, I think it is within the scope. Um, and I think it's appropriately something that the center should be interested in and focused on. Um, now, uh, in some ways, if as I if I'm as if as I'm suggesting, even things like global warming has implications on what happens in the hospital, right? So, you know, what choices I make in the operating room about what instruments I use and how many instruments I use and whether they're disposal or not disposal, things like that. You know, all of those things you could argue, well, those are decisions that affect an individual patient, but also have a much broader implications for sure. Um, so I, in some ways the, the question becomes if, if everything, is encompassed within clinical ethics, then what's not? And I'm, I guess it's, to me, it's not so much what's not, but how is our focus, uh, you know, what, what makes it clinical ethics? And that's where I do think that um, this sort of practical implications at the bedside rather than a, completely theoretical framework. I think that's where I would rather try to make the distinction rather than sort of how big is our scope of view, if that makes sense. Dan. Yeah. yeah. Right. To patients and families who are there physically. Sure. Yeah. And where a little bit of impact on other items. It's not a matter of thinking, it's kind of scope. Right. Identifiable individual. Yeah. Person. Yeah, it's a great point. And I mean, there is no question that. Um, if we, if our focus is really just on who's in the room, who's around the table, as it were, um, that 
sort of presupposes a um, sort of a first come first serve. You happen to be in the bed, and so now we're more concerned about you than someone else who you know never got in the bed yet, and so we don't know them. Um, so I, I think that that is true. There is um, there's an asymmetry there, and I'm not quite sure how to manage it. Um, but it is, um, it's a reflection of the reality. Uh, and to the extent that it should be, that reality should be changed, uh, I'm not sure. You know, I, I, but I would agree with you. It, it, it's, this isn't, this isn't a solution per se, but perhaps a, a way to get to a solution. Yeah, Mike. Just a couple of comments. Um, you know, you mentioned the measurement quality. Like, I think we've never been better, better at measuring things. We've talked a little bit about AI, but whether it's AI or technical innovation, like it continues to rapidly um, impact the practice of medicine. My assumption of, of most of our colleagues is that those result in you know improvements in ease of practice and patient outcomes. That's just natural and um, and I think they forget, like, that, you know, many of the questions we ask in medicine are actually public ones, which are addressed through uh, medical ethics rather than using large language models. Uh, I think there's also an over-reliance on that assumption in what you had in communities who actually stopped engaging yourself about, you know, about principles, about whether or not this is a right. harm patients. I think... Um, I am probably making this up, but I feel like Marcus told me about being here when they came up with intensive care units. And it's like, you know, well, let's we, let's figure out what the right thing to do for the patient is because we have this technological new thing that we're doing. It feels in some sense very similar to the story that you described. The other thing that I think is will be very interesting um, that wasn't quite here, but I, it, I feel like there's a lot of discussion about professionalism in medicine. Mm -hmm. And um, definitely amongst the trainees, um, there's sort of an existential fight about what is professionalism and what's right. And it, it got, some of it gets into the burnout and other things. Yeah. And I yeah. think that that will probably have impacts on our clinical ethics because, you know, many of us that train in a single generation came up believing that there's a, a way to do things ethically and unethically in the care of patients. And now the professionalism part of that is being challenged and that may um, result in Changes to our ethical norms about what we think right. is right, or, or the defense of those norms. Yeah. So anyway, just comments about the broader landscape. Yeah, no, I think absolutely excellent points. And, and you know, I, I do think that that's, um, I mean, all of those things suggest to me that um, far from sort of feeling like, well, you know, we benefited from Dr. Siegler's uh, sort of. Uh, his emphasis on the ethical implications of the decisions that we make at the bedside every day, right? We don't need to get an ethics consult to realize that, right, we're making ethical decisions all the time. Um, but I do think that, you know, your points uh, further emphasize the idea that we're never gonna get to a point where we've put ourselves out of business, right? We've solved all the ethical issues. There aren't any more, right? We've got it confined um, because it's, we now, I think, realize that the scope is both broader um, and the impact of the decisions at other levels that have an impact on, you know, what happens in an in individual patient case. Um, so thanks. Mark. Everybody know when bioethics started in the United States. Right? 1966. 1966 was the year that I graduated from here at the University of Chicago. Uh, bioethicists were brilliant, brilliant people, theoreticians and scholars. Uh, legal scholars, they were fantastic. 
Does anybody know what percent of them were physicians or surgeons and clinicians? Uh, originally. Ten percent. Ten percent. And so by by 71, 72, as I finished the chief residency here at the university, um, I, I decided that it was essential that uh, that our bioethicists who were not clinicians and were not directly working with physicians um, ought to be added to by our clinicians. And so that, that's when I started in 71, 72, the field of clinical medical ethics. Uh, here at the university, we did the first program in the country in clinical medical ethics, and it, it spread around the country over the next uh, 10 years. And in 82, 83, we, we went officially with the permission from our president of the university uh, to establish it. So you're running the 42nd, 43rd year, um, and you were adding great additions uh, to the program. Uh, but but it's, it's, it's really, really valuable. Uh, and, and I'm just so proud of how, how you, you do it. So congratulations. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Next week, um, we have an outside speaker, um, Dr. Tolkien from, not J.R.R. Tolkien, but a different Dr. Tolkien, uh, from uh, Yale. Uh, and I believe that we are in this room, and I believe that lunch will be provided, but only if you sign up. Uh, and so... Um, we have tried to get this room because obviously it's more conducive to discussion than P117. Um, but since we almost had to fight off the pharmacists uh, because they thought they were scheduled in this room, uh, make sure that you check your calendar because it we may be going back and forth between P117 and here. So, all right. Thank you all very much. Thank you.